So open your Bibles there to John 16, if you could. I was down at the cathedral about a week or so ago, a week ago uh, Friday, and uh, they had a 20-somethings event down there, and they asked me to speak, and it was kind of fun. And, and uh, so uh, Kathy and I went down together, and they were doing their whole preliminary and everything, and I was just kind of sitting in the back underneath the balcony in the dark. I didn't think anybody even knew I was there. It was probably still a half an hour, 40 minutes till I was going to speak. And, and so they had them all breaking up into groups, all these 20-somethings, hundreds of them from our church, and they were all going around. And the question they were to ask one another was, um, what is uh, the best Christmas present you ever received? Now just think about that for a minute. All the way back to your childhood, maybe it was last year, maybe it was 30 years ago, but what is the best Christmas present that you ever received? Well, of course, I was sitting back in the corner of the cathedral thinking to myself, well, you know, how would I answer that if, if someone came up to me and, and sure as shooting these two uh, young women in our church? I'd never met either one of them, but they were friendly and kind. And they come, well, Pastor James, they said, uh, what was the greatest Christmas present you ever gave? Well, of course, I said, uh, the greatest Christmas present I ever got was in 1967. Uh, my family was living uh, in Toronto for one year. We had moved from London to Toronto. My dad was getting his master's degree in education. I was six years old. And my uncle, my dad's brother, Carl, he was the best gift giver in the family. He actually uh, passed away this past year. And he was the best gift giver. He had these presents wrapped so perfectly. And I can remember taking this present from under the tree and shaking it, and to James from Uncle Carl and shaking it and listening to it. And, and, uh, well, when I opened it, best Christmas present I ever received, it was um, a G.I. Joe sea sled. And these were the ads. I had seen these ads about how it can go, and I pictured myself in the bathtub with my brothers, you know, and we all, this thing could go dive underwater, and it could come back up again. You could put your G.I. Joe right on it, had a little motor and a propeller. So show another picture of it. I don't think you're getting it, how amazing this thing was. <laughs> I just, I just, somehow you're not getting this. I can tell you're not getting it. And this, and what was crazy was a friend of mine who I was in his wedding, he was in my lifelong friend, a guy named Mark Hicks. In fact, his uh, daughter and son-in-law work at our church here uh, in Chicago. And, um, but he happened to be over at my house that day and, and uh, he took it and shook it. And I was dying to know what was inside it. He took it and shook it and he said, that sounds like a G.I. Joe sea sled in there. <laughs> Now, you're going to think this is crazy. I was already an adult before I figured out that he didn't figure it out, that someone had told him, and he was sort of slipping the information to me on the side. It took me a long time to figure that out anyway. Hopefully that um, gets you thinking about uh, gift giving. Please, please do not think of gift giving as part of the secularizing of Christmas. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift that has ever been given. Amen. And Jesus Christ is the greatest gift giver that has ever been and is. Yes. The idea of giving a gift is so central to Christmas. And yes, there is much that is secularized, and I will say something about that in a moment. But, but please do not think of the gift giving as, as, as anything other than, than trinkets, that, that embolize the greatest gift that has ever been given. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. So I got a title for this message, Christmas Gifts from Jesus. How's that sound? Chris got five of them. You can even write a five there by the title if you like to jot things down. Five Christmas Gifts from Jesus. You know, uh, Christmas messages aren't easy for pastors, especially when our preachers who have been in the same church for 25 years. And, and uh, so I was like, well, should I keep going with, with John? Should I, should I, you know, pull over to the side for a minute and come up with some Christmas message? And in God's kindness, I mean, I think you're going to see it too. I see so much Christmas in this passage. I was like, when I read it, I was like, sweet, sweet. <laughs> we can do both. Finish John chapter 16 and talk about five Christmas gifts from Jesus. Here's the first one. Ultimate joy. Ultimate joy. John 16, verse 16, from where we left off last time. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you'll not see me. And again a little while and you'll see me. Because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean a little while? Well, we don't know what he's talking about. It's interesting, uh, 
these references, John 7, 33, John 12, 35, John 13, 33, and John 14, uh, 19. So twice in the upper room discourse from John 13, four times overall, he, he'd said this a bunch of times. A little, little more, a little more time, I'm going to leave, I'm going to be gone, this is a little while longer. And, and apparently this had burst forth in some kind of, and we got we to gotta know what this means and what's really interesting is, is they're standing, what, a foot, two feet, three to five feet away from Jesus, and they're whispering and thinking, he don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Incorrect. Notice Jesus knew that they, of course, he, so, turn to your name and say, of course he knew. Course he knew. <laughs> Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what, what you mean? Is this, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Is this, is this what you're debating about? And, and by the way, um, this helps me. Isn't it nice how patient Jesus is? He's not like, how many times do I have to explain this to you? Not, not like that, not at all. He's, he's like, is this why you're asking this? Is, this? is this what you want to know? So patient. And then verse 20. Now, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful. Notice weep there means to cry or to wail as in the context of a death. And uh, notice that the world is rejoicing. The world's view of Christ's death uh, is vindication. Um, the Christian view, of course, of Christ's death is, is awful payment and punishment for sin. The word there, sorrowful, um, does not mean merely sad or discouraged. It's the soul pain that we associate with profound loss. And so when Jesus says to them, um, truly I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice, you will be sorrowful, here it is, but your sorrow will turn uh, to joy. Literally, your sorrow will become joy. The very sorrow that you feel will be transformed into joy. That's just awesome. The world rejoices because Jesus is crucified, as today it rejoices because uh, he is uh, marginalized at Christmas. Now, uh, how many of y'all have heard this uh, term of uh, the war on Christmas? This is going everywhere now. I, I didn't even know there was a war on Christmas. At first, I didn't care. I try to always proceed knowing by caring. But in this instance, um, I did not know that this was a huge deal. And now that I know, I, I do not uh, care. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, people are so worked up about the war on Christmas, the war on Christmas. And uh, did you know, for example, did you know that the, the top, what do you think are the top five uh, Christmas songs? Go ahead, write a couple down. What do you think? Top, uh, don't write it. <laughs> Have I somehow encouraged calling out in church? Have I done that? <laughs> I believe I have. I believe I have. So, all right, then fine, I'll, I, can, I can change gears. Hey, call out what you think is, don't write anything down. Call out what you think is your uh, favorite, or not, not your favorite, but what you think is the most favorite Christmas carols. All right, here they come. All right, here they come. Here they come. Uh, number five, uh, Jingle Bells. Number four, Silver Bells. Number three, Winter Wonderland. Number two, uh, White Christmas. Number one, Chestnuts. Roasting on a really, really, no away in a manger, no silent night, no joy to the world. No, uh, none at all. In fact, um, I don't know if you saw this online. There was an elementary school uh, out in New York State. I think uh, maybe on Long Island. I was watching this little news clip. And the teacher had all these kids, kind of like what we just had up at the front of the church. And the teacher had all these uh, kids up, and they were singing a Silent Night. But, you know, ever the politically correct, uh, she changed... <laughs> this is insane. 
This is what the kids sang. A silent night, holy night. Glory streams from heaven afar. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. That was the song. Silent night, holy night. Glory streams from heaven afar. Sleep in heavenly peace. Nice tune. Inane lyrics. Well, you know what they left out round yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant so tender. See, they left out Jesus. They, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a war on Christmas. Sarah Palin wrote this uh, book, um, Good Tidings uh, and Great Joy, Protecting the Heart of Christmas. And uh, she quotes uh, in the book here uh, a particular, I don't know if you, Dave Barry, I don't even know who that is. It's an author, well that helps. <laughs> I'm glad you're in the front row. I mean, you, you, carried the ball way, you carried the ball way down the field with that bro. Okay, so come on, come on, love you, here, here it is. So, so this guy Dave Barry, who is a, an author, he, <laughs> he, he, check this. He says, in the olden days, it was not called the holiday season. The Christians called it Christmas and went to church. The Jews called it Hanukkah and went to the synagogue. The atheists, or whatever they called it, they went to parties and drank. So if you pass someone on the street, you just had to figure out, oh, that's a Christian, Merry Christmas. Oh, that's a Jewish person, Happy Hanukkah. And then anyone else, you just say, hey, watch out for that wall. <laughs> Apparently, I did not know this. Apparently, uh, there was um, uh, a long-standing uh, Abby and Tony, a favorite place of our family, is Santa Monica Pier uh, in California. And Abby and Tony actually got engaged to Santa Monica Pier. We've had a lot of fun uh, family things that we've uh, done out there. Um, I was not aware that they have a 60-year-long tradition of uh, the Christmas story. Uh, they would actually have local churches would go out and set up various nativity scenes all the way along the beach, and people would go out and, and uh, walk along the beach. The idea of Christmas without cold is sort of foolishness anyway to me. But, <laughs> but, but so apparently some guy in 2009 was so offended by the Christmas, um, uh, the nativity scenes and so on, that he uh, set up a booth right next to one of the nativity scenes on which he wrote Thomas Jefferson's alleged quote, religions are all alike, founded on fables and mythologies. Well, he has a right to free, free speech. Then next year he put up another sign that said, happy solstice, like we're celebrating the position of the moon or something. Well, then he got a bunch of people together the next year, and they actually filled out a bunch of forms, and the city allowed them to erect... Um, some 18 different booths along with these nativity scenes, uh, they erected them to various imagined gods like the, past, the Pastafarian religion, um, and they set up a display to the flying spaghetti monster. Well, then, of course, all the Christians got completely sideways about this and started fighting with them. Nice play. Started fighting with them and back and forth and... and uh, Anyway, the city kind of got tired of the uproar, saw the religious war, said, we don't need this, and now they don't do anything. I don't care, and you shouldn't either. There's no war on Christmas. The Christians love Jesus. No one else gets it. Welcome to reality. Yeah. This is not a majority religion. We are on a narrow road. We are the few that have found faith in Jesus through the grace of God. It's not a popular thing. The only ground we hold is the name of it, Christmas, the name of it, and the Christmas story itself. All other Christmas real estate, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, sending cards, all of it is paganism, if you just study the history of it. Stop fighting for Christmas. There's nothing to fight for. The followers of Jesus are celebrating. The rest don't get it. Why is there a war over something? We don't own anything. Stop trying to make earth heaven. This is not our home. Amen. Clear? Amen. Okay, if you get all wound up by that, loved ones, you lose your joy. No one can take your joy from you. If you know who Jesus is, if you know what he's done, if you know why he came, if you know what he did, why would we expect that people who don't get it would celebrate it? It's 
foolishness. Just don't understand it. Notice Jesus here. Truly I say to you, you'll weep and lament. The world will rejoice. True that. Thank you, Jesus. You told us the way it would be. He said, you'll be sorrowful. Here it comes. But your sorrow will turn into joy. What will that be like? Well, let me give you an illustration. Verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, let's have all the men say, I don't get this. <laughs> Correct, you do not. She doesn't want you to act like you do. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. That's heaven right there. See, it's an illustration. When she's delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Well, how does that apply to this? Here it comes. So also you have sorrow now. Some of you have had great sorrow in your life this year. Some of you have had great loss. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. This is awesome. And no one will take your joy from you. That's heaven. Amen. That's heaven. Amen. And heaven is coming, and the little bit of joy we have at Christmas, and the little bit of joy we have in our lives, and the little bit of Jesus' joy that we experience as his followers is going to be eclipsed by an awesome, eternal, unending, never changing joy that will last through endless eons of time in eternity called heaven. Hallelujah. That's what we're looking forward to. That's what we're fired up about. And all of that is ours because of the first Christmas. Because, why? Because Jesus came. That's the first Christmas gift. What would this, how much of this would there be? Allow your mind to wander into the dark possibilities of this world if Jesus had never come. And for those who don't know him, that is still their reality. I'm gonna fight with them about Christmas? How about being an example of the joy that he brought? Instead of a cranky Christian all upset because he lost real estate, he never had. It's just outrageous, honestly. Sometimes how Christians behave is just outrageous. We have a right to nothing. We're slaves of a king. Quick, get a thimble and fill it full of your rights. We deserve hell. We've been graced with heaven. We have ultimate joy. What a gift. What a gift. And then this gift, it's not my list, it's his list. Five Christmas gifts from Jesus. Here's another one. Answered prayer. <laughs> Answered prayer. Notice verse 23. In that day you'll ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Wow. So why aren't more Christians experiencing that? The joy of answered prayer. The gift of answered prayer. Well, James chapter 4 says, you have not because you ask not. Some of it, it's just you flat out don't pray. When was the last time you took hold of God's throne room about something? And you went after it. So you have not because you asked not, but then James 4 also goes on and says you, you uh, have not because you ask amiss. It says amiss. I like that. That was amiss. <laughs> How come my prayer didn't get answered? That was amiss for sure. Sometimes we don't get our prayers answered because we pray for stupid stuff. Selfish stuff. Foolish stuff. And notice Jesus puts this, this qualifier 
on all prayer. Whatever you ask, what does it say? Come on, Christians, I'm just teaching the Bible to you here. This isn't super fancy. Whatever you ask, what? In my name. In my name. That's not some little post-it note you slap on the end of your prayer. All right? That is the atmosphere that you submerge your prayer life in. Jot these three things down. In Jesus' name means, in Jesus, you'll get more answered prayer if you get this. In Jesus' name, to pray in Jesus' name means, first of all, I am connected by faith to Jesus. That is, that is my whole access to the throne room of God is faith in Jesus. I believe Jesus is God's son, the savior of the world. I'm connected in prayer because of my faith in Jesus. I say, well, I just don't feel like I can pray. I, I just feel like I, I haven't been the man that I should be. I, I don't talk to God because I, I think he's probably going to tell me some stuff I don't want to hear. Okay, well, that's the good news of the gospel right there. Jot this second thing. To pray in Jesus' name means connected by faith in Jesus, covered by the work of Jesus. That, that I'm covered over with a robe of righteousness through faith in Jesus. And, and I, have, I can come boldly before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4 says. I have access to the throne room of Almighty God because of what that Christ child grew up to do and accomplish. And then finally, in Jesus' name, means consistent with the goals of Jesus. I believe the only prayers that are answered yes are those that advance his purposes, his time, and his methodology. Which leads to this. Sorry for two lists in a row here. I don't want to wear anybody out. But I think sometimes we don't pray enough because we, because we don't pray confidently. And we don't pray confidently because... So here they are, five confident prayers. You can go home today. You can get on your knees. You can go after these things. And God will answer you. He'll do these things. You pray for the right stuff. Number one, pray for salvation. Pray for people to be saved. Pray for people that you're going to be with this week or later this month. Pray for them to come to know Jesus. And pray for God to change you into a more compelling example of what a Christ follower is. And while you're praying for God to save them, God will make you into a person who's a compelling witness to Jesus. And really go before God and pray, Lord, nothing matters more to me. Second Peter 3, 9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so go before the Lord and, and seek him in prayer for the salvation of people. Here's another prayer. This will get answered every time. Uh, uh, pray for forgiveness. Pray for the strength to forgive. Some of you, you have people you need to forgive. And ask God for the strength of it. He, won't, he will not disappoint you. That will not go unanswered. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. And if you, I mean, some of you, um, you struggle with bitterness and hard-heartedness, and you're, you're more cranky and cheerless than you were five years ago because you're not forgiving. And you need to forgive, and God will answer. When, when you pray about that stuff, When's the last time God help me forgive? That'll be, that'll be answered right away. Grace is flowing to that prayer request immediately. Here's a third one. You can pray this confidently. Pray for endurance. Hebrews 10, 39, we are not as those who shrink back. We press on. Pray for endurance. I pray for endurance. Pray for the strength to keep going. Pray for, for the strength to keep loving and giving for another day, for another week, for another month. God will hear that prayer. You can pray that confidently. You can be sure God does not want you to give up. And so when you pray and ask him to help you endure, he will. And then pray uh, for faith. Mark 9, 24, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Ask God for faith. Say, Lord, I think I don't pray more because I don't believe enough and help me to believe more. And then I love this one, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything give thanks. This is the will of God concerning you. Pray for gratitude. God, I feel like I'm kind of a cheerless, ungrateful person. God, pray for me to turn my attention uh, to, from the things that would grieve me to the things that I could be grateful for. 
You go ask God to, help, to make you more grateful. You go spend 10 minutes and ask God to make you more grateful. Then get your pen ready and write down 10 or 15 things that you have to be thankful for. It'll change your whole outlook about things. Well, I wish God would answer my prayer. I just gave you five things. Go pray about those things and get ready to get rocked uh, in a hurry. This is what praying in Jesus' name means. And Jesus says, in that day you'll ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. That's what it means to pray in his name. Ask, and you'll receive. Your joy will be full. Just think about all the things that we're being prayed about in the Christmas story. I got thinking about Mary. So here's Mary riding on this donkey, I guess, to Bethlehem. Or did she know that the one to whom she brought her prayers was in her womb? I'm going to go with a no on that. Wow. Then I think about Joseph. So he gets this news his wife's expecting. He knows it doesn't involve him. He's trying to figure it out. Angels had to appear to him. Did Joseph realize that his prayer for wisdom about his problem pregnancy was to the problem pregnancy? Did he realize he was praying to the problem he thought he had? Did the wise men know that the king they were seeking made the star they were following? I was having fun writing these down. <laughs> Did the shepherds ever see that the Christ child they worshipped had commissioned the angelic choir that directed them to the manger? Guys, this is an incredible, incredible story. We need to get off our high horse. War on Christmas. He pitched his tent under a star in a stable on straw. That's the one we're with. That's our guy right there. And the gifts he gives. So, stole these from Dave Lernan's office. <laughs> I'll give it back. How much of your hands been like this? It's one of the gifts he gave. You can talk to the God of the universe because of Jesus. Somebody say, what a gift. What a gift. All right, here's the third thing. Father love. Father love. Verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. Well, that's for sure true. He's been talking in figures of speech a lot, stuff they can't really figure out, like... Unless a grain of wheat, John 12, falls in the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I'm the vine, you're the branches. When I, the Son of Man, have lifted up. What do you mean, lifted up? What's that mean? I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Yeah, because you're going to... He hadn't told them. He, he, he hasn't said to them, okay, in about 15 minutes... I'm going to be praying, sweating great drops of blood. Then they're going to come and arrest me. Y'all are going to flee. Then they're going to beat me and scourge me and, and, and uh, sentence me to death. And I'm going to carry a cross. And they're going to force a crown of thorns on my head. And they're going to nail me to that cross. And I'm going to watch me die. He had not told them these things. And that's why when he says the hour is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in figures, there won't be any point of speaking in figures of speech because everything will be plain. He, could, he didn't tell them because they couldn't handle it. How often do we ask God for clarity? And he doesn't tell us. Why? 
You couldn't handle it. If you knew, if you knew what I was up to, it would make your head explode. All right, don't tell me that. And that day you'll ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. This is an incredible verse. I do not say that I'll ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. See that there? I do not say to you that I will ask the Father. She's like, yes, I'm a mediator. Yes, I'm an advocate. But you can walk directly into the throne room yourself. My Father in heaven loves you. And he loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came from him. That's really something. Mothers are incredible. Mothers are irreplaceable. That was a great spot for an amen, yo. Amen. You boys are slow. <laughs> Want another try? Yeah. <laughs> Mothers are incredible and irreplaceable. Amen. But there is nothing that can replace the need for father love. I did some, just Google this yourself, I did some study on the statistics of from youth suicides to runaway children to behavior disorders to rapists to school dropouts, um, drug and alcohol abuse, incarceration, fatherlessness, fatherlessness, fatherlessness. You can study the statistics yourself. I don't want to grieve you except to say that we live in a fatherless society and celebrate a Savior who came to give us access to the perfect, eternal Father. Fathers provide love and protection, wisdom and guidance, support and encouragement, and Jesus came to provide us a heavenly Father who gives all of that to us. Years ago, I preached a series at Christmas. Many of you were in the church then. It was called God's Amazing Love for You. And we spent a whole uh, month of December on that series. One of my favorite stories that came out of that series was maybe a year or two later when that series went on the radio, <laughs> there was a guy who was listening to me preaching on, you know, um, God's amazing love for you. And um, the way that he got listening to it was, he, we got a letter they sent us and told us this whole story in a letter. He stole the car. He steals a car. The CD, God's Amazing Love for You, is playing on the CD player in the car. He's so convicted by it that he turns around and goes to the police station and turns himself in. <laughs> and all God's people said, praise God. Praise God. He, the world is so desperately in need of the message that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, there's a God who loves you. And everything that your heart has been looking for and longing for is found in this Father God who you can be reconciled through, to through faith in his son Jesus who came, lived, and died. So I wasn't sure what to put for this. So you got joy, ultimate joy, answered prayer. I really liked this picture it was given to me. That, that's us. That's us right there. The baby. The one that needs the love of the father. And then this, jot it down, fourth gift, lasting peace. Lasting peace. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. <laughs> the disciples were like, ah, isn't that funny? It's funny. Ah, ah. Let's read the word together. What does it say? Ah, now you're speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came. See, the, he was reading their minds. If you understand what they're saying there, he was telling them, you're thinking this, you're wondering this, you're talking about this. And they're like, oh, you really are from God. We're blown away. Jesus answered them. <laughs> 
uh, kind of, um, I wouldn't say sarcastically, but, but, but certainly he's confronting their newfound confidence. Really? Really? Do you now believe? Really? Do you now believe? The NIV honestly translates this poorly. NIV says, at last. Now, but it isn't the point. He's not saying you believe. He's questioning the fact that they really, and you can tell from what he says next. Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. When you will be scattered. Notice, not into little groups. Each to his own home. And will leave me alone. He's feeling that pain already. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have, next word, peace. there it is, peace, peace. Peace. It's interesting, as you notice this, that even though Jesus questions their allegiance um, he uh, does not abandon them. Make a note of this. Jesus does not abandon us just because we abandon him. He's like, y'all are going to blow out of here on me, but I'm not going to leave you, but you're going to leave me. Right. And then that word. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. How interesting. I don't know how many of you can remember January 2013, but the first three messages of the year were how to have peace with God. And now that we are coming to the end of our year together, how could I have known, how could you have known, how could we have known the ways in which we would need God's peace this year? We defined it as the calm assurance that what God is doing is best. That regardless of the weather, regardless of the health, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation, that um, what God is doing is best. You know, on the Rolling Meadows campus today, we had the Burlock family up here. There was Verlee in the middle with her green blazer on and love that family. Some of you might not know that all 10 of those are her children and their father passed away this year. And, and, you know, people are going through things. People two rows back from you, one person over from you. People are facing things. We're facing things. And I'm telling you, this peace is real. It's a real thing. It passes understanding. If you have it, people will look at you and, how on earth are you still? It's peace. God gives peace. It's a Assurance that what God is doing is best. That at, at some point, darkness will give way to light. Valley will give way to mountain again. And God will be shown true and victorious and right and awesome as he's been all along. And everybody who held on to Jesus and held on to his peace will be thankful that they did. And so, um, you know, peace, that's kind of hard to come up with something for that. So I had this little uh, peace uh, dove thing. And um, I've actually been working on this. This is going to be the first time I've ever done a miracle in church. This. <laughs> All right. I am, <laughs> I am yet to do a miracle in church. <laughs> but I've experienced a miracle. Yeah. I've experienced the miracle of his peace. A calm assurance. When I haven't had it, it's because I gave it up myself. And when I've wanted it and sought it again, he's given it freely and generously. It's really an awesome gift. Jesus knows how to give uh, good gifts uh, to his children. Um, ultimate joy, answered prayer, father love, lasting peace. Last verse, last part of the verse. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, someone get ready to say amen. In the world you will have tribulation. Amen. But take heart. The words there, take heart, um, are pretty phenomenal words. I just jot this down. An overcoming heart is the final gift. And the words take heart mean take courage. Uh, some translations say be of good cheer. The idea of cheerful, courageous, confident, joyful, seizure of every challenge. 
In the world, you'll have tribulation. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Now, just look up here for a minute. Take heart is such a good word. It, it, it's the idea of get after it. Get after it. Don't sit back on your heels. Don't hang your harps on willows. Don't, don't, don't believe that your best days are behind you. Step up into the faithfulness and promises of God. Be of good cheer. Have a courageous heart. Get after it. God's going to do some awesome things. Let me say by faith, 2014 is going to be one of the greatest years our church has ever seen. And, and amen, come on. And he that bears fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. And I've promised you multiple times that we would not fail in humility. And by God's grace, we have not failed uh, in humility. And, and God has some awesome things coming for us. And I just see such good things come from perseverance. When I was uh, young, I, I, I played basketball. And when my knees and ankles got too bad, I played more golf. And I don't know, the last few years, I've just got kind of sick of golf. And I tried a couple of different games that just weren't worth it. And so I decided a, a, a couple or three years ago that I was, um, <laughs> this should make you laugh if you know me, it made my family laugh. I decided that I was going to be a hunter. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and, and uh, um, you guys have the gift of discouragement today. No, 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 for really, though, I, I, I was going to be a hunter, so I, you know, tried a couple of things that didn't work, and I went with some friends, and it took too long, and you had to be quiet the whole time, and, <laughs> and it was just, it was terrible. So I got real serious about it last spring, and one of the men, Bill Martin, in our church, who was one of the founders of our church, he's been here since the first Sunday, and Bill Martin took me out to Idaho to this guy that he knew, and, and, uh, or he met something, some walk in the word guy, I think, and a listener, and anyway, we went... A bear hunting. I sat up in a in a 18 feet off the ground with my 308 rifle and ready to go, ready to go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. I mean nothing but the wind through the trees. And a little weeping on my part. Then <laughs> Day two, same, nothing. Day three, same, nothing. One time, in the middle of day three, I saw a little bear kind of come maybe. I don't know, 500 yards, too far away, kind of looked around and ran away. I was like, yeah, this is, this is really awesome. <laughs> Finally, on the last day, in the last hour of the last day, before we had to go home, big chocolate brown bear comes into the camp, comes right up to the, they have these, like, these bait that they put out for them, and I'm telling you, it was right there. Now, some of you are like, don't kill it, wrong. And I took the best aim that I could, and I went right in on that thing, and I, I missed. <laughs> I missed. And I'm telling you something. I was so upset. I haven't even been able to. I would have told you that story a long time ago. I've been too upset about it. <laughs> this past week, I went up to Michigan with uh, Jeff Donaldson, and uh, we went uh, deer hunting. Check this. Do not cry for that deer. Do not do it. <laughs> Killed Bambi. I knew. I was ready to hear all that. <laughs> You're darn right I'm fired up about that. I'm going to eat every bit of it too. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm really amazed. I'm really amazed how people look at people who have accomplished something and they think that they got a deal, found a shortcut, won the lottery, what? I don't know anything worthwhile in this world, certainly I don't know anything in Christ's kingdom that doesn't require a lot of endurance, perseverance, staying after it. And here Jesus Christ gives us such a good word as our final Christmas gift. He gives us you know, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world and so on. So I took that as my a good cheer thing. And then I had this idea that <clears throat> I could put all of these uh, together into one. Oh, I've got to get the right one first here. I think that one goes in. And then that one goes in, correct. And then that one. But I was supposed to put the lids on, but I 
forgot to. The reason I did all of that was so that I could show you this. This is, this is the gift right here. The gift is Jesus. The gift is Jesus. With him, you get everything. Without him, you have nothing no matter what you have. Amen? Amen. 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 Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Let's stand and sing.